False doctrines pop up all the time. And the only way we can recognize them is through a proper exegesis or pulling out what is already in the text so that we're not led astray into false or harmful ideologies. So here we're going to focus on a very particular church. Shinjioni, sometimes spelled Shinjonji, or abbreviated as SCJ, is a pseudo-Christian religion primarily practiced in South Korea. The religion's official name is Shinjionji Church of Jesus, the Temple of the Tabernacle of the Testimony. So it was created by a man named Lee Manhee in the 1980s and currently claims just under 200,000 adherents. The word Shinjionji itself is a combination of the Korean terms for new heaven and earth. And by the way, at the time of this recording, that number is approaching 400,000 adherents. And that's why this is a necessary discussion. Additionally, they write, the group is headed by a single charismatic leader, Lee Manhee, who claims to have a special ability to interpret the Bible. When challenged about his authority, Lee can be evasive, but he frequently implies that he is immortal and that salvation requires faith in him rather than in Jesus Christ. In fact, Lee's Shinjionji Church teaches that the Bible is primarily composed of metaphors and he alone has the spiritual gift for correctly interpreting them. Stay tuned until the end. If this is your first time here, make sure and hit that subscribe button and click the bell so that you never miss a video or an interview. Our goal is to help you enter into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. So let's begin with some positives. The church's website notes that, like the love we have received from the heavens in receiving water, air, and light freely, we share the love that God has given to us with our neighbors, community, and the whole world through our work of service and volunteerism. The people of Shinjioni are public servants. Just as Christ gave his life to serve others, we follow the footsteps of Christ to serve rather than seeking to be served. The public servants of NHNE, that's New Heaven, New Earth, have been recognized for their contributions to the community and to other nonprofit organizations, and have received many accolades, awards, and recognitions for their work. Whether it's cleaning up beaches, revitalizing neighborhoods, or being a friendly face to the marginalized, the people of Shinjionji are truly being the light to the world. Additionally, Shinjionji volunteers have been commended and recognized for their medical volunteering service for foreign laborers in South Korea. Mural paintings to beautify communities and erase graffiti, events for veterans, culture and welfare support for the elderly, meal donations to the marginalized, and community cleanups. For example, the Visiting Doctor program protects the human rights of all immigrants and laborers and provides health care for foreign laborers who live in South Korea. On average, the program serves 18,000 foreign laborers each year. So good works are a good thing. And we can always kind of commend those actions. In fact, anyone of any religion or no religion can do these sorts of things. And they do. The problem comes when the doctrine of professing Christians or churches is not in accord with Scripture. And that's the only issue I want to deal with here. So first, we're going to discuss the leader of this movement or church. His name is Lee Manhee, and the website says these things about him. From his birth and childhood... Chairman Lee Manhee was born as the descendant of the lineage of Korean kings, a lineage 500 years old, and was born in a poor countryside on September 15, 1931. His name was given to him by his grandfather when he dreamt that suddenly the sky became dark and then a light appeared to shine upon his daughter-in-law. He made the name then and called his grandchild this when he was born, the name Manhee, which means complete light. Lee began a life of faith by praying together with his grandfather when he was young. He developed the habit of praying every morning and night on the high tops of the mountains on Sunday, but never went to church. One day, he was praying as he always did, when a large star that he had frequently seen before came to him from the sky and he saw this star for three days. 
Starting from that time, those around him started to persecute him for no reason, and soon after, he met a person from heaven. He wrote a pledge of his devotion to God in blood, and since then, endured through countless hardships. He saw the corruption of the pastors as he carried out a life of faith, but he also saw and heard the congregation's loyal effort and prayers. He endured through turbulent ways in carrying out faith. He has been homeless and penniless before. Each time he thought about the pledge he made in blood and re-strengthened his determination. Lee, who started out his life of faith in the countryside, heard the voice from heaven to go to the Tabernacle Temple and went to the Tabernacle Temple in Guachan to serve there. But after seeing the Tabernacle Temple, which started with the spirit, became corrupt, he tried to correct this wrong, but there were those who tried to harm him, so he went back home. After returning to his hometown, Lee spent seven years in the New Village Movement. During this time, the person from heaven came to him again and commanded him to send letters urging for repentance to the Tabernacle Temple. As he returned to the Tabernacle Temple to call for their repentance, there was unimaginable persecution and imminent death. But Chairman Lee, who endured this, experienced the events of the entire book of Revelation being fulfilled and received the open word, the scroll. They were things beyond imagination. He perceived that he was the one sent to testify to the churches about the fulfillment of Revelation, that he was the messenger, the advocate from Revelation 22:16. It was a reality that he could not deny no matter how many times he read the Bible was in front of his eyes. It was clear that if he did not testify the word that he received, then the work of God promised in the Bible would not fulfill. To testify to what he saw and heard was so difficult and overwhelming at that time. But still, he testified and is still testifying today. So listen, we have to remember that there is an already happened, as in the lifetime of those hearing the words delivered by John, and a not yet happen when we're reading the book of Revelation. Now, I won't delve too much into that here, but you all know how I feel about poor or completely absent exegesis. So let's take a look, a closer look at Revelations 22, 16. It reads, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Now, I hope there is no disagreement even from man he that the root and descendant of David and the bright morning star are direct references to Jesus from 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16 and Malachi 4 and 2. Now, the misinterpretation and thereby confusion comes in on the first part of the verse. Who is the angel God is referring to? Well, it may have been Gabriel. It may have been Michael. I don't know. And it really doesn't even matter. And it shouldn't matter for any followers of Lee Man He either, because whoever the angel is in this verse, the angel had already been sent and had already completed what he was sent to do at the time of John almost 2000 years ago. There's no reason to assume that this is in reference to some coming promised pastor or advocate. In fact, I'm not even entirely sure how they or Lee Man He even arrived at that particular conclusion. The Bible makes clear that Jesus is the only advocate that we need. So the verse, Revelation 22, 16, in Greek reads like this. So this word, which is transliterated in English as have sent, denotes a completed action or in reference to the action currently being completed. In other words, the angel Jesus sent to John to say what we now have in the book of Revelation. But let's go even further. The Greek language has many verb and tense variations, and one of those which doesn't explicitly exist in English is the aorist tense. Now, the aorist active indicative expresses the simple occurrence of an action in past time. One source says, while the Greek aorist is very often translated as a simple past tense in English, its implications in Greek can be quite different. The use of the Greek aorist has more to do with the author's view of an event than with the time at which that event happened. But regardless of what time is implied by the verb in its context, aorist forms like those in the example above imply that the speaker or writer conceives of the action as a completed whole or wishes to present it as such. This implication is called the aorist aspect. The aorist is the verb form used to refer to an action which the speaker or writer presents as complete and which may require more specific definition in some contexts. For example, in Matthew 26, 65, Jesus says this, which is, now you have heard 
the blasphemy, as in you've already heard it. In this sentence, the hearing is not presented as in progress, but as complete. So what is the message that Revelation 22, 16 is giving us? Jesus had sent his angel to deliver the message of Revelation to the Apostle John. He said the message of Revelation is for the churches. Presumably, churches should be teaching and heeding the contents of the last book of the Bible. So to ignore the book of Revelation is tantamount to rejecting the gift Jesus has presented to the churches. And that's it. That's the message that John, by way of God, was giving the people of his time as well as us. Additionally, as Duvall and Hayes note, you have to be careful not to confuse John's direct identification of an image, those mentioned above, with John's fluid use of images. In other words, John is not shy about using the same image to refer to different things. For example, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. But John also uses the image of a star, not the seven stars, to refer to other things, such as God's agents of judgment or even Jesus himself. In other words, we're not looking for some end-time pastor or church to whom we must all submit. And this is important because the church's website also says, Shinjionji is the kingdom of God that God has created in order to fulfill today on earth as it is in heaven. It has been created as the result of God's 6,000 years of work. And it is the holy temple where the priests and people who will receive salvation within the Lord belong to. So you can only be truly saved if you're a part of this church. And so in order to mitigate these issues and hopefully to prevent anyone else from getting involved with this church, let's do a brief refresher on hermeneutics. See, hermeneutics is the art and science of interpretation. We're not at liberty to invent or inject meaning into the text of scripture. There are rules to follow for accurately understanding the Bible and understanding and then aligning with God's original meaning. So the word exegesis comes from the Greek from exegestai to interpret, from hegestai to guide or to lead. So we take the meaning from the text. We do not import meaning into the text. That is called eisegesis. So without going through an entire seminary class, let me just highlight a few hermeneutic principles that I think can help us here. First, our goal is to uncover the meaning that the original audience would have gained. Our goal is to begin in the land, culture, and language of the original audience and arrive in the land, culture, and language of today while preserving the meaning and intent of the text. This requires us to cross what Duvall and Hayes have called the principalizing bridge. This bridge gets us from the author's mind to ours, from the original audience to the present audience without replacing the original meaning. Now, in order to cross this bridge properly, we have to recognize that there are several gaps we have to traverse, and they include a time gap of thousands of years, a cultural gap, a language gap, and a context gap. Now, I don't actually think you even need to know all this in order to properly interpret these two verses in Revelation, but let's continue. Second, originally there were no chapters and verses. A lack of chapter and verse divisions was not an issue for the early church or the first theologians. There are over one million quotations by the early church fathers in the second and third centuries of what was eventually canonized as the Bible. So this meant that those church leaders had to read the entire letter of Matthew or Galatians in order to reference a specific part from those letters. But the important thing for us to remember in the 21st century from a hermeneutic perspective is that because the Bible was not written in chapter and verse format, when we quote a particular scripture as chapter 3, verse 12, that verse to us was and is part of a larger sentence and a larger thought and a larger letter. Keeping this in mind will help us to keep scriptures and stories within their original context. In this way, we allow the text to speak for itself and the meaning the author intended to remain intact. Third, be a faithful interpreter. Listen, there are three people involved in the hermeneutical process. They are the original author, the original audience, and the interpreter. And we are always in the role of interpreter, but there's rules to this. And we're in essence reading someone else's mail. Hermeneutics gives us as interpreters proper parameters through which to read that mail so that we accurately assess the text and convey its true meaning. 
So here's the general rule for understanding the text of Scripture. The text can never mean what it never meant. Come on, man. The text can never mean what it never meant. The text can never mean what it never meant. The text can never mean what it never meant. As the interpreter, we are to uncover the meaning, not create it. So many false ideologies and heretical doctrines have been you know, formulated by people because of their inattention or inability to determine the original meaning of the text. But we owe it to God to do our homework so as to uncover the truth about what actually occurred or what God was intending to convey. Now, let's return to the Shinjionji Church's website. The Shinjionji Church makes clear that if he, referring to Lee Man He, that if he did not testify the word that he received and the work of God promised in the Bible would not fulfill. So without Man He, God can't operate in the earth the way he wants to? Also, what about all the Christians, including the original saints who were before Man He? We'll just leave that aside for now. Also, this sounds remarkably like the Mormon claims regarding Joseph Smith, the Seventh-day Adventist claims regarding Ellen G. White, and the Muslim claims regarding Muhammad. Any other figure that takes preeminence or priority over Jesus Christ in a Christian church is wrong. Period. Full stop. Now, further down on their website, it reads, we introduce you to the theology school that has been established according to the promises of the Bible and only teaches the Bible. A free theology center, and they reference Revelation 22, 17, Zion Christian Mission Center is where those who have been harvested and sealed with the open word, the new song, the words of prophecy's fulfillment to create the 12 tribes. This is where the throne of the spiritual realm and God are. But Revelation 22, 17 reads, both the spirit and the bride say, come, let anyone who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires take the water of life freely. So the first part of this statement, once again, exegetically, hermeneutically, meaning we follow the proper biblical and historical methods of analysis to arrive at the meaning of the text, makes no sense. It reads, the spirit, that's God and the bride, which is the church, all believers, not just from one church, say to everyone else, come to Jesus. And the funny thing with all this, and maybe not so funny, is that this passage or these scriptures in Revelation are actually some of the easier to understand and more straightforward passages in the book of Revelation. Yet, Lee Manhe has misinterpreted the Bible and hundreds of thousands of people are following him. So Revelation 22, 17, as they have cited it, has absolutely nothing to do with some kind of foretold theology center. The only two actors in Revelation 22, 17 are God and the bride, aka the church. The word for bride in Greek right here is a nominative, singular, and feminine form of the word. So in no way is this referring to a future male prophet or a future prophet of any kind. Their website also reads, those who have been harvested are sealed with the open word. Honestly, that sounds kind of scary. Those who've been harvested? But I assume they mean those who have heard the true word of Lee Man He, but the only thing believers are sealed with or need to be sealed with is the Holy Spirit. I don't need nobody else putting their sealing touch on me. Also, the 12 tribes are not being created. People aren't competing to kind of get into a tribe. And so in one sense, I'm glad they put all this on their website. Um, they're open and honest about what they think and believe as well as who they follow. But I'm also saddened by the fact that so many people don't read their Bibles well or at all. See, this type of heresy is easily preventable and easily countered if Christians begin to actively and intentionally read and study their Bible. And just to clarify, my mentor used to tell me all the time that if you don't have a, a paper and pen or a computer or something to take notes on, you're not studying, you're just reading. When you study your word, you get to commune with God. I shouldn't have to sell folks on this. <laughs> But if you live in a country where you're free to read your Bible and don't, 
then when you're led astray by this or any form of deceit, that's on you. So let's all do better this year in terms of growing in our knowledge and understanding of God and his purpose for us. But I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments. Have you heard of this church before? And has have you known anybody that's been influenced by them or, or, or kind of recruited by them? Or where do you see a lack of biblical study and the impact of it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Until next time, peace.